Isn't it a beautiful weekend? Ah, oh, just love the, the weather. Um, 70 some degrees. I will take that year round. Anybody else? Yes, awesome, awesome. Well, I know that uh, it's been a good weekend. I think the Royals even like won yesterday, right? Um, let me get you get kind of caught up, <clears throat> okay? So some of you, uh, if you've not been here before, uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, we are actually in a series in the book of Romans, and our series is called Rooted. Everybody say Rooted. Rooted. We believe if you're on the journey of faith, and hopefully every one of us are, Okay, it is a journey, and there's ups and there's downs. Okay, that's just the way it is. We live life, there's ups and downs, and so the journey of our faith is the same way. But uh, it, we have to be rooted. When the storms of life come our way, we do not want to be blown, blown away or blown you know, down or whatever the case is. So we believe the way to be rooted is in the Word of God. Okay, and so that's why we named the series a Rooted, and that's the reason we've been tracking. Now, this is te- the 10th week that we've been in the series, and I just want to catch up. Some of you weren't here from the beginning, so let me catch you up real quick. Paul is the author of the book of Romans. Paul is, is a, a man that has been educated. Um, he is, he's got all the credentials that you need to be in a position that he is to write to the Roman church, okay? And he has been through a lot. If you weren't here at the beginning stages, uh, Paul was persecuted like no one, no one else uh, in the New Testament. He was beat, he was bruised, he was jailed, um, he was stoned to death practically. Um, and so would you think that he's been through a few things? Yes, he has. And yet, he does something that's so powerful. Even though he's been tortured, he still stands for his God. Because he knows truth. He knows the truth, and he wants everybody else. Have you ever been, like, sold out on something? And you just, you just, you just, you're convinced that it's right? I have this opportunity all the time with my wife. I'm right, right? And we have these, you know, these conversations. I knew I told you this, right? No, you didn't tell me this. I wasn't hearing. Anybody have selective hearing? Yeah? We all kind of do. You ever done something just stupid? All the time, yeah. Well, I did a few stupid things. Let me just kind of bring you into my life, okay? I did a few stupid things this week. Um, on, on Friday, I decided on Friday, okay, about 12 to noon, I try to take Fridays off. Um, and uh, um, between some phone calls and fielding some uh, emails, uh, I decided, okay, mom, mom went shopping. I think she had to go grab some stuff, so Anna and I went to the pool. And so we went to the pool at like 12 to 2. And, you know, of course, we take the suntan lotion in the bag just in case. Well, we didn't put any on, right? Now, Anna, Anna was fr- fine because she's been to the pool a few times, but I have not. So today, I, you know, when you put a shirt on, it just hurts. That's, that's where I'm at right now. You know, I, I am sunburned on my shoulders. My face got actually a pretty good bit, a good bit of sun as well. But um, I will say that that was pretty stupid. And then yesterday, yesterday, I talked the family into doing a hike. And so we all went, including the dog, to a trail that we've never been on before. And I just knew that trail went a certain way. Seven miles later, we get back to the car. <laughs> Let me tell you, <clears throat> sometimes you just do stupid things. And uh, you'll, you'll kind of get this in the message today, but um, we had a little bit of complaining along the way, right, Luke? Just a little. Uh, we all thought we were going to die on the trail. Especially Anna, when we had to actually cross over a bridge where there's cars flying, and she called it the death trail. <laughs> she was worried because we did pass probably seven or eight roadkill, which was nasty. She was afraid she was the next one. <laughs> yes, and so that was, that was a, you know, kind of a stupid thing we did yesterday. But we had fun, we survived, and uh, we didn't quit. We didn't quit. And, and here's, here's the thing. On the journey of our faith, that is the, the best thing you can hear today. 
The best thing you can hear today on this series that we're walking through is Paul did something. He didn't quit. And if we could just follow that along throughout, throughout our journey, if we just don't quit and we are persistent in moving forward, and we'll get to that passage here today in Romans chapter 2. But let me catch you up. So Paul, he's writing this book. He wants us to know not to quit. He wants us to know that God, God has uh, things in order and he's provided certain things for us on this journey. And so we were in chapter 1 and, and we talked about all the godlessness that was taking place. If you read chapter 1, you'll see that in the latter parts of chapter 1. People are turning away. They are not receiving the revelation. Everybody say revelation. Revelation is important, and Paul's saying there's revelation from God. He's saying that he is a God that is revealing his, his truth, but yet people reject truth, don't they? They turn away from it. They don't believe it. They think their way is better than, than God's way, and that's, that's really the problem of humanity. We think we know it all, but the very person that created us the very person that created us, and when we are created in his image, he knows it all, not us. Amen. And so we get to a place where we think we know better, and we choose our own path, and we choose our own journey, and it gets us in trouble. And we see that in the latter part of uh, chapter 1, and all this, this godlessness that was taking place. People turning away from God and turning to sin. And we've talked about that. And then, and then Paul says, listen. Not only is there revelation of his truth and revelation of, his, uh, of his, his, his righteousness and revelation of his power, we see that in, in chapter 1, but there's revelation also of his wrath and his anger. And we've been talking about that if you've been here. And it's true. He, does, there is, he is a God that's angry if you turn away from him. Okay? He's not happy if you turn away from him. But then we go into chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2, which we were two weeks ago. And in chapter 2, we talked about the fact that, yes, he has wrath, and there's, there's judgment coming, and the fact that you are not the judge. Remember, you are not in a place where you should be judging somebody else. And that's where we were in chapter 2, verse, verse 1 through 6. We dealt with that. You're not the judge. Who is? God is the judge. So that's where we're at today. So if God is the judge, I want you to turn to chapter 2, if you would. Chapter 2. Verse number six is where we'll get to here in a second. But Paul told us this. If we're not the judge, and he is, Paul, I believe, tells us these two things. When it comes to really two reasons we shouldn't condemn others, okay? Now, I don't know about you this week, did, were you, or in the last few weeks, really. Were you convicted in any way about judging anybody? My hand goes up. Okay, I think we all can get into that, that danger zone of looking at somebody, seeing what they do, and judge them. We're not supposed to condemn. Okay, Paul tells us that. And really, Paul told us not to condemn based on, I think, two reasons. Number one, our condemnation, our condemnation is hypocritical. It is. And it's inaccurate. We don't know all the details, do we, church? We don't, we don't know all the background of somebody. We don't know their history. We don't know everything about them. There's only one person that knows everything about you, okay, and that's God. So if God knows everything about you, that's why he's the judge, and that's why Paul dealt with it in chapter 2, right? He's the, he is a God that is going to judge. He is the judge. His judgment is truthful. His judgment is impartial, and his judgment is loving. That's why he's the judge. So we discovered that, obviously, two weeks ago. But if he's the judge, and we're not, if we could just get that right, that would be good, right? But if he's the judge, then how does he judge? How does he judge? So if we're keeping track, Paul actually has given us really a few insights on, on, on God's wrath as well. Romans chapter 118, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men. Okay, so the revelation of God having, uh, having this wrath is in chapter 1 verse 18. I want you to see something that the wrath of God is current. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Anybody getting old? All of us are getting old, right? Anybody ever experienced the consequences of sin? You all have. Every one of us sitting here have experienced the consequences of sin. 
And it's not fun, is it? No. No matter what you've done, there are consequences. And I want you to see this, and Paul's trying to tell us this in the first few chapters of Romans. We will exhibit the destructive force, you'll see it in front of you, of sin. Because sin's revealing consequences are the earthly penalty we bear. And it's a result. If you do something stupid, you'll get burned, like not putting suntan lotion on at the pool. Okay, now, I was sharing with my neighbor yesterday, I was telling him, I don't know why I confessed to him, because, you know, he always, we kind of pick on each other sometimes, we have fun, but I shared with him, you know, the fact that I went, got, got burnt and then went on a seven-mile hike that, you know, and really wasn't planning on a seven-mile hike yesterday, and he said something like this, he said, well, you know, you can't fix stupid. <laughs> I was like, oh, thanks, Doug, I appreciate your ministry, right? And it's true. It's true. You, sometimes we do some stupid things when it comes to sin. And we do things that we think we know best for. But there are consequences to the results. Are you with me? Okay? If you're here today and you've never experienced those consequences, uh, come and talk to me. Let me know what you're doing. You know, uh, But there is a result to sin, and it is a destructive force, and we need to know that. And Paul warns us that God's wrath is not only current, but it's actually a coming a day of his wrath as well. There was a day that there will be judgment later on. And so that revelation, we see that in chapter 1, that it's a current, uh, current results of sin, and then there's future results. And so Romans chapter 2, verse 5 we read that the last time we were together. You are storing up wrath against yourself on the day of God's judgment, on the day of God's wrath. In chapter 2, verse 5, we've read that. So what does that mean? That means not only do you experience the consequences of sin in your life today in some areas, but there's a day that you're going to have to account for those things. That's what Paul's saying. Now, let's transition. Let's go to today, chapter 2, verse 6 through 16. And we see that Paul is defining it this way when it comes to God being the judge. This portion of scripture actually represents for all of us, we will either receive wrath, everybody say wrath, or you will see reward, everybody say reward. Which would you rather have? Of course, we all would. We had this talk in our living room yesterday with our children. We did. We sat down, and we just chatted, and we talked. And, uh, you know, um, as a family, there are times we get kind of like, you know, irritated with one another, right? And sometimes we say things maybe you didn't want to say, right? And uh, we were just in a setting where we were all, like, tired. <laughs> and uh, we were sitting in the living room, and uh, it was kind of a complaining afternoon, Okay, you know, because everybody was sore and tired. And, and uh, it got to the point where, you know, everything that was coming out of our mouths was not very encouraging to one another. Okay, you ever been there? Okay, and so it wasn't very encouraging. So we actually took a time out, said, okay, and we do this every so often. If you want to practice this at home, I encourage you to do it. It's good. What we'll do sometimes is actually just stop, and each of us will have to go around and tell something to somebody else what they appreciate them about them, okay, in their character, or you know some type of um, some type of deal in their lives that we we appreciate about them. And so we started to go around and we started to kind of just chat. And uh, I think Luke Luke or Anna went first. We made them go first, and uh, they encouraged one another. Um, and uh, kind of spoke into each other's lives, and we all did that. Um, and the reason we did is because um, it's encouraging just to get edified once in a while, right? And uh, sometimes you have to be intentional about it, and so yesterday we decided to do that. And during that conversation, um, I think Luke said that, you know, that he loved me. He loved how I loved him, even though he doesn't deserve it. Um, and, and, and I'm just being transparent. I can be transparent. Every time I use them as an illustration, by the way, I have to give them a dollar. So um, <laughs> I'm praying that, that that doesn't go up over the years. But, um, but anyhow, so, and, and so we talked about that. Luke and I had this conversation. All of us were there, okay? We're sitting in the living room. 
And he kind of explained what he meant by that because sometimes he'll do something that he's not supposed to do. But, um, and we all do, right? But he said something. He said, you know, but you, I know you still love me despite that. You know, and, and as he said that, I'm thinking, you know, that's our God. Our God, no matter what we've done, church, no matter what you've done, what you've walked into in your life. And some of us have had some really strange journeys, haven't we? Some of you kind of found yourselves in some dark alleys that you wish you would never find yourself in. But even though you found yourself there, God is a God that will still search for you and find you. Because he loves you. No matter what you've done, he still loves you. And, and that's, what, that, that's what Luke was talking about. And I said, yeah, you know, that's true. It is so true. But you know what? There are times when we have to correct you as parents. And so Ashley and I had this conversation with our kids. It's not because we don't love you that we tell you not to do something. It's because we do love you. And we want to protect you. And we want what's best for you. Do you know our God is the same way? He loves you so much, he's trying to give you guidelines, and he's trying to give you guardrails in your life so you don't do stupid things. Are you with me? And so we had this conversation in our living room yesterday just talking about what, why, why we give direction and correction and discipline. It is because we do love you. But I would say this, that we were talking, you would rather, you would rather be rewarded than corrected, wouldn't you? All of us. And we would all rather receive the rewards that God has for us than to receive his wrath for us, wouldn't we? So all of us are on the same page. But you know, it's a choice. That's the incredible thing about our God. He's given us choice. And Paul is here in Romans chapter 2 saying, listen, listen, God is the judge, not you. But let me tell you how he's going to judge. Let's pick it up in verse number 6. God will repay each person according to what they have done. So God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality. He will give eternal life. He's saying, listen, for everyone that pursues him and is persistent... To, to, to go after God and to honor him and to seek God and his glory, they will be rewarded with eternal life. We see that in John 3, 16, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever loves him, they should not perish, right? But have everlasting life. So those that pursue God will have eternal glory, eternal life. In verse 8, let's pick it up in 8. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Paul's making it a pretty, pretty, pretty simple here, isn't he? If you do what God wants you to do when it comes to seeking him, you're going to have a reward. But if you reject it, well, there is consequences. And then verse 9, there will be trouble Hmm. And distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Hmm, that's interesting. So, Paul, if God doesn't show favoritism, why is it first to the Jew to the Gentile? We'll get there. Paul is now, now listen, he's not teaching here. Some people will read this passage and think, well, Paul's teaching salvation by works. No, he's not. Matter of fact, he's, what he's doing, he's emphasizing that God's impartiality is between Jews and Gentiles. It's impartial. It's, he doesn't show favoritism. Paul, Paul is saying, listen, he's repeating first the Jew and then the Gentile. He's speaking chronologically here. He's speaking in chronological order. He's saying that in, to the Gentiles of the Roman church to respect the fact that God's chosen people are from Israel. That's his chosen people. So he's mentioning that out of due respect for, for the Jewish nation. Okay, It's not because of favoritism. That's why he clarifies it's not because they're first and you're second. It's just out of honor and it's out of the chronological order in which he's chosen to write. And so we see here clearly in, clearly in verse 6 that God actually judges all of us according to what we have done. 
So if you're taking notes this morning, how does God judge? If he's the judge, how does he judge? He's judging based on our conduct. Wouldn't it be nice if God judged us based on what we intended to do? (laughs) I intended to do that. I intended to do what was right, but I didn't. I didn't. Well, I think it's pretty straightforward here that God's, God's judgment is based on what we actually do, not what we intended to do. Okay, church? So we have to look at that. So conduct is a way we act, it's the way we live, and it's the things we do. That's, that's what he's going to judge on. He's going to judge our lives based on the way we act, on the way we live, and then the way we do things. So let's take a verse, let's take it the next verse, verse 7. To those who by persistence in doing good, we give, well, he will give an eternal life. We're just going to walk through verse, for, verse by verse here. It may sound that we, like we can earn salvation here, church, but we can't. We can't earn salvation. Matter of fact, it would contradict what Paul just told us in chapter 1, verse 17, that salvation comes through what? Salvation comes through faith. That's where salvation comes. Salvation comes through faith, not by your works, not by what you can accomplish, not by what you do. But what's this persistence about? Well, there's a couple different theories when it concerning this, and I'll just tell you this. Number one, Paul is reminding the believers here that although salvation is by faith, our conduct conveys our convictions. Are you with me? If you have convictions for certain things, you're going to conduct yourself to match those convictions. It's just true. If you're convicted that Coke's better than Pepsi, you're going to buy Coke. The reality is this. If you're convicted of something, you use it. My mother is, con- is convicted. Um, she has this certain convictions about her recipes. Certain butter works better than other butter. Anybody like that? Like certain sugar, domino, it has to be domino sugar. Everything else will just be awful. It has to be domino sugar, you know, just the way it is. That's how my mom is. Anybody else like that? Yeah, some of you had those weird convictions of those things. Some of you, when it comes to washing clothes, okay, certain type of detergent. Some of you, when it comes to fabrics that you wear, okay, or the things that you put in your hair, the shampoo. I've been using the same soap, not the same actually bar of soap, (laughs) Now, if you can invent that, you'll do very well. If you can invent that, but I don't think you can. But I've, I've been using the same type of soap since I was a little kid. It's just because I'm convicted that that's the soap that is the best. Because it's what I was introduced to, and that's what I use. Anybody like that? They've used the same soap all their life. Anybody? And it's just a few. Okay, there's a couple. Some of you guys like to change. Okay, there's another hand. That's awesome. I'm not the only one. That's good. But your conduct conveys your convictions. And can I encourage you of something? Be convicted that God has your best in mind. And follow him. Follow him. And God's going to honor. And he says that in his word. And so it's kind of like relationships. You know, our walk of faith requires persistence. Stability. Never giving up. That's what persistence is. We discovered that on our seven-mile hike yesterday, huh, Luke? We even came across, like, on this trail. There was, like, nothing to sit on. I mean, we didn't sit the whole time. And literally, we're, like, in our seven miles, we're, like, we knew we only had a mile left. And we come across a picnic bench in the middle of nowhere. It's like, God, you've provided And we walk up to it, and literally, this is so funny, we're like, should we sit? And we're walking, and all of us are like, no, we'll never get up. Let's keep going. And it was so funny, so we didn't. We just, like, let it there. We just kept walking. You know, it's kind of funny. Our walk and and our journey of faith is kind of like that. We get, we get like, you know, we have a rough day or whatever's happened, and then there's this, there's this obstacle that is going to, you know, maybe distract us or something like that. And what happens is if you get your eyes off the goal, right, 
and, and you start to relax, you put your guard down, you might not be as persistent as you should be. And then you give up. But that's what Paul's telling us here. What does persistence mean? It means don't give up. No matter what you're going through, no matter the hard times, the difficult times, Paul's saying, listen, there's a reward in heaven that's waiting for you. Don't give up. Be persistent. Amen? Finish the course. Finish the race. You guys that are graduating, Caleb, Eric, and Lynn, listen, you didn't give up. You were persistent. That's the reason you're going to get to graduate tonight. And that, God's going to honor that. But you know, before you can graduate, sometimes you have to take an exam, don't you? I always love that at final time. You know, it's like, oh, no. But have you ever been caught without preparing yourself for a test? I have. I've, I've, walked, I've, walked, in, I've walked into uh, some college classes I was taking, and I was like, there was a test today? I didn't see that on the syllabus, right? And we give all the excuses. But yeah, you know, there is a test coming. And there's a final exam one of these days that we're going to have to take. And that's what Paul's talking about. And he's saying you need to be persistent. And you need to make sure you're prepared. And you need to make sure what's on that test. And guess what? Paul's giving us what's on that test. He's going to judge us. God's going to judge us. He's going to test you on your conduct is what he's going to do. See, the second thing, the second, the second theory, and I kind of got distracted there, and I apologize, but the second theory is, is here, not only, not only is Paul reminding us that salvation is by faith, and that's one theory, the second theory is we must appreciate the truth, and the true fact that persistence in doing good is actually impossible under the law of Moses. Because James says this, actually, in James chapter 2. So if you think your works will save you? It won't. James actually said, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, read it for yourself. He's what? He's guilty. He's guilty of breaking all of it. So your works ain't going to save you. It's your faith. Receive salvation by faith or receive judgment by works is really what Paul's saying. And I'd rather have the first. Would you say amen? See, this theory actually seems to be really hand-in-hand hand with what Paul's going to get to here in our next few, few verses. So let's, let's look at verse number 12, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. And it says, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is, it is those who actually obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, in verse 14, when you Gentiles, again, he's writing to both the Jew and the Gentile. He says in verse 14, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their conscience, their conscience also bearing witness. In their thoughts, sometimes accusing them, and at other times, even defending them. Judgment here, and we're going to get into a little more of what this means um, when it comes to what Paul's dealing with. Judgment is not only conduct, and we see that in verse number 6, but Paul's saying judgment is going to be based on our conscience as well. Do you realize every one of us has a conscience? Every one of us. And... That conscience actually is something that God instilled in every one of us from, from birth. He created in us a understanding what is right and what is wrong. Each of us. And you, you also have a free will. Every one of us has a free will. But we also have a conscience. Paul is, says here, he says, it's not the fact that you heard the law or actually even heard the word or even knew the rules, but it's that you violate the small voice inside. Do you hear me? Paul's saying, no matter what, if you've known the law, he's dealing with the Jews and the Gentiles here. You understand that? Some of them have had the law, the written law, and some of the Gentiles have never heard it. 
But it says, you, you know what? It doesn't matter if you've heard the law or if you haven't heard the law. There's something that God's giving you both. And that he's giving you a conscience that tells you what's right and wrong is what Paul's saying. And he says, you have to listen to the inner voice. Now, it's interesting. We talked about prophecy in, in uh, the beginning uh, of our conversation in the book of Romans, that the prophetic word has gone through the Old Testament, and Paul's used the prophecy that has taken place of, of God's revelation. And we see that there's actually prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. I want you to see this. Jeremiah actually pro prophesied this, and he said that this is the covenant I make with the people of Israel at the time, after that time, declares the Lord. I will put, check this out, I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their what? God will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. God, in, 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 in our conscience, he reveals to us what is right and what's wrong, is what Paul's telling us here in this portion of Scripture. The new covenant, which is awesome about the new covenant, and when, when Jesus comes on the scene, in the Old Testament, no one could approach God. But the new covenant, we have access to a relationship with God. That's the beautiful thing about the New Testament, and they're actually the New Covenant. God's providing that we actually have access to God through what Jesus did on the cross. And so if you wonder, if you're sitting here today and you wonder, what happens to the individuals that are in the uh, deep, remote jungles of the world that are shut off from all civilization? What happens to them when it comes to hearing, uh, or actually what happens to them if they never hear about Jesus? Have you ever wondered that? Anybody? I have. I'm like, how, how, what happens if they never heard about Jesus Christ? What happens to them? Do you know that, that studies throughout time, when it, becomes, when it comes to archaeologists and, and anthropologists and missionaries, they have never discovered, actually, at a civilization that, um, that reflects a civilization of atheism. Did you ever know that? They've never found a civilization that are atheist. Matter of fact, this is why. This, there's a universal desire in mankind to worship. God created us that way. God created each of us with a, uh, inside of us a conscience, not only to know what is right and wrong, but he's created in each of us a desire to worship something. There is a universal desire in mankind to worship. In every tribe, it doesn't matter how small, throughout history, there has always been some type of system of worship. Always. Something else that is universal is that the violation of our conscience. Everyone fails to live up to their own standard of what's right and what's wrong. Every one of us. That's universal. Something else that's universal is there's a universal moral compass. And there's also a universal nature that, devi that deviates us from it. So we have this thing inside us. Everybody say conscience. Do you know our conscience is, in, is not infallible? It's true. We can make mistakes, can't we? There's only one person that's infallible, and that's our God. Our conscience is not infallible because we get to choose what we are the path that we take, if it's right or with, if it's wrong. And so we see here that Paul is saying, listen, we have a judge, yes, but this judge is going to base his judgment on your conduct, and he's also going to base it on your conscience. Meaning, no matter what you have been through in your life, no matter if you've been revealed truth, the more you know, the more you're accountable for. Did you know that? The more you've been exposed to of truth and the word of God, the more you're accountable to. And so the people in the jungles, okay, the people in the jungles, guess what? They have a conscience. They might not have been exposed to all the light in the world, and they still live in darkness. We live in a dark world, folks. We all live in a dark world. And the reality is this. Some people have not seen the light. And others have. Right? Is this considered light? Is this light? 
Even though it's dim, even though it's dim, it's still light. And what Paul is saying this, listen, he's saying to the Jews, he's saying to the Jews, you guys have seen the light, you've seen the law. The Gentiles, they haven't seen much. But God's still going to judge them based on the fact that they have seen a little because of their conscience. Are you with me? No matter who you are, no matter what you've been exposed to when it comes to the law, Paul is saying this in Romans chapter 2. He says, no matter what the light, if it's been dark or if it's been a big light or if it's been dim, you are accountable because of your conscience. Because God has written law on your heart, you should know what is right and you should know what is wrong. That's what Paul is saying. So you don't have an excuse. And matter of fact, Paul says there's no favoritism either. Because all of us need what God has provided. So I did that illustration to show you that Paul's saying, no matter what light you've had in your life uh, and what you've been exposed to, there is there's accountability that you're going to have. And so judgment is based on conduct. It's based on conscience. Here's the third one I want you to see today. Judgment is based on our character. Everybody say character. Character, character matters. Verse 16 says this will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as, as the gospel declares. When God judges people's secrets. Listen, our secrets reveal the real reasons we do what we do. I sent this out, I think, uh, this past week when I was studying um, for this message on Facebook. You might have seen it this week, but I believe this is true. Our reputation, it comes from what people can see on the surface, but the character comes from what only God can see. That's true character. And so where does God judge us? He judges us based on our conduct, what we do, how we carry out our life. He bases it on the judgment on our conscience, what you've been revealed to, what God has already revealed you. Some of you have been revealed. Some of you have, have better knowledge of, of, the, of the word of God than others. But we're all in the same boat. And then he says, Paul says, listen, now that you know that you're not the judge and God is, he's also going to judge you on your character. And that is what he sees and not what everybody else is. Your secrets reveal the reasons we do what we do. Can you say your motives matter? Don't they? That's what God's saying. That's what Paul was telling us here. Your motives truly matter. How you carry out your life. Paul is relentless. He is relentless in this pursuit to convince the Roman church that both the Jew and the Gentile of this very thing, no matter what you know, no matter how much you've been taught, no matter what your background is, church, no matter what, we all need Jesus in our lives. We all need what he offers to us. See, listen, on judgment day, when that comes, you will not be able to stand before God and say that my conduct was blameless. You will not be able to stand before God and say that my conscience is guiltless. You will not be able to stand before God and say that my character is spotless. You won't be able to do that. None of us. But can I tell you the last thing I want to tell you today? I think all of us in this room would say, I want to reward not I want the reward that God has for me, not the wrath. Would you say that? Does anybody have conviction of that? Yeah. I hope you do. But can I tell you the most important thing that Paul's trying to convey here? He's, he's given us these warnings. He's telling us, yeah, you're, you're going to be accountable, okay? You're going to be accountable, yes, to your conduct. Yes, you're going to be accountable to your conscience. Yes, Paul's saying you're going con- to be accountable to your character. But if, if I can relay this to you and you get nothing else today, please get this. God wants to be your Savior not your judge. He wants to be your savior, not your judge. He wants to be your defense attorney. 
He knows you've been bad. He knows the junk that's in your life. But God sent his son to be the defense, the best defense attorney for you. But you have to hire him. I've never been on trial personally. But you know all of us are going to be on trial someday? Hello? Now, some of you have been on trial one or two or three or four times. Okay? And you want a good attorney when you're on trial. Are you with me? Can I tell you, Paul is saying this, you are going to be on trial. Would you rather have a judge or would you rather have the Savior? That's what Paul's saying. And I definitely want the Savior. So you're here. No eyes bowed, no eyes closed. Let's all look around because we're not judging, right? Remember, we're not the judge. Thank you, Jesus. You're here today and you say, Pastor Brandon, I know I'm on trial. We all are on trial. I know I'm on trial. I don't want the judge. I want the Savior. Is there anyone here? You want the Savior? Yes. You want the Savior. Is there anyone here today you say, all my youth up there, you guys had a great week, right? I want you to come down front run, real quick. Come on. Don't trip down the steps. Make your way up front. Some of them went to camp. There was about 10 of them went to camp. There's some uh, here in a few weeks. We're going to, to kids camp. And we're taking uh, a big uh, a group to kids camp. They're going to have some powerful moments with, with God as well. I want you guys to come down front. Anybody, it's in youth. Now, listen, th- come on in. Some of them went to uh, camp this week. And then we had seven, actually seven, um, that just moved up that were in youth this past, uh, this past uh, Wednesday. Um, my son and another group. Um, if you're in youth, why don't you just come down? Come down front. If you're in youth, okay? You guys have just you guys have just went in. Come on over here, Luke, on this side. I think everybody else is over here. Keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. This is awesome. Now look now. now now, come around the front. Come, come clear across the front. Spread out. Because these people over here on the right, they have bad eyes. Come on over here. <laughs> now, this to me, okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. This, this, this is where my heart, as a pastor, I get, start to get a little excited. Because um, I don't know about you, church, but... This, this group of uh, young people right here, some of them that went to camp, some that are just moving into the youth group themselves, not only is it the future of the church, but it is the lifeline to what God wants to do in our community and through their schools. And I don't know about you, but this right here represents a movement of what God wants to do in our community. Amen? But what's exciting to me is you guys aren't at home like sleeping in. You guys are like at church. And that's that's awesome. That's encouraging. God's doing I'm telling you, God is going to do something through these group of people. God's going to use them as teenagers to encourage their classmates. Listen, there's a reward for you. God loves you. We have a savior. And that's the, that's the message that Paul is telling us through the book of Romans. And that's the message that these young people have heard this week. And some of them probably got messed up around the altar, which is a good thing. Okay? That's okay. I've been there, man. I've been, I've been messed up many times. It's okay. It's okay to get messed up in the presence of God because he has a reward for us you don't want to miss out on. And so you're here today. Okay? You're here today. And you want to say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Maybe it's the first time. Maybe you want to rededicate your life. Is there anyone here in the audience? I want you to just raise your hand right now. 
Yes. Anybody else? You just want to give your heart to Jesus. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. There's a few hands that are going up. Here's the deal. We have a we have uh, something we do here at Inglewood that's that's really important, and that is we have a discipleship track that everybody probably should be involved in. I think that's a conviction of ours as a leadership that you should be involved in the discipleship process here at the church to learn about your journey. But I want to pray with you today. It's only 1138. We've got a little bit of time. Let's pray this prayer. Would you pray this prayer with me today? If you've raised your hand to make Jesus the Lord of your life, would you repeat this? Lord, Lord Jesus, I thank you that my, you're my Savior. I thank you that you've given your life on the cross to save me from my sin. Help me to serve you daily. Help me to trust you. Help me to have faith. Help me to be persistent in seeking you. Help me on this journey of faith. Help me to be rooted in your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen.